Hello. Today, we have Crystal Clear to go through. An open world Pokemon Crystal ROM hack. Yes, open world. And I think Shockslayer, the maker of this ROM, did this pretty well. You're free to choose to start your adventure in any of the Kanto and Johto town, each rank accordingly in difficulty. The gyms and overworld trainers scale up with the number of badges obtained, making it still possible and enjoyable to traverse through. Story-related map obstacles and HM-related hindrances are removed, enabling us to travel across the map without obtaining said game mechanisms first. This, of course, removes some major story elements in these second-generation games, such as the Team Rocket encounters in the Slipwalk Well and the Goldenrod Radio Tower. We're doing this video a bit differently, as I'm going through this game with only three general objectives. Getting all 16 badges, beating the Elite Four, and meeting Shock Slayer at the end. There are quite a lot more addition to this game, but we're going to cover them as we progress through this video. Before we start though, if you enjoy these kinds of content, be sure to leave a like and all that jazz. It would definitely help with the channel growth. We start the game with the option of choosing our starting town. This was already hard enough. I think I spent a good chunk of time just mulling over where to start. I eventually settled down in Blackthorn City, choosing a starting point with max difficulty. What could go wrong? Then, there was also the character customization. There's a handful of characters you can select from, and even the sprite color. This too, of course, took another chunk of time. And once we were done with that, the game gives you a nice whopping selection of starters, with 20 of them in total. Great, more options. Since I chose Yellow as my avatar, I thought it was only right to choose Pikachu to match your team in the Pokemon Adventures series. In hindsight, I should have named the Pikachu Choo Choo. Nevertheless, we went with the moniker Fool and our Pikachu named Pikafool. Fantastic. We spawn in this random house in Blackthorn City, which kind of caught me by surprise. This lady downstairs just started asking about a Butterfree trade. I honestly thought she was going to be this game's mother. We found this Swinub, a very common theme in this ROM hack, next to this cliff, and it beckoned us to follow it up the cliff. This area is Mount Rose, one of the many additional areas in the game, fully traversable and explorable. While just wandering about Mount Rose thinking how to tackle Claire, I found this hole on the ground and it led us to the dragon's den. We found this house in the cave, and the fact that we can call a fella by the name of Randy to purchase the house. We pass on the offer because of the house's poor location, and discover that we could indeed take the dragon trial. We answered all the questions, and obtain an extreme speed Dratini, nicknamed Drafool. We would then spend the opening hours training Dratini at Blackthorn's gym. We went to challenge Claire for the first badge after defeating all of her gym trainers, and it was pretty much just Drafool trying to get by the fight with Twisters. Pikafool failed to take out Claire's horsey, but Drafool was able to hang on until Claire's last Dratini. Unfortunately, Drafool got paralyzed and confused, ultimately unable to finish the fight. Great start to the run. We tried again immediately after that loss, and was able to survive and win the fight with better RNG. We were able to secure the first batch with a team of Pikafool and Drafool. Apparently, the Pokemon League staff had nothing better to do than to monitor every trainer out there who had won a badge, as they took the time to call and update us on what's been going on. A good example of Crystal Clear's map changes here, where passing through Ice Path to get to Mahogany Town isn't required, and vice versa. We spent a good bit of time here, just battling trainers and generally leveling up. In the shady shack in Mahogany, the rocket hideout in the basement has been changed to the Mahogany Bazaar, where they sell objects and upgrades to the player's house. Our character Fool hadn't really acquired an ice house just yet, so there wasn't much to do here. We spent the rest of the hour grinding before challenging Price. I went in a bit unprepared, as my Drafool's level was a bit too low for the gym. Drafool couldn't take out the swine up, and even though Pikafool was able to down it, he wasn't able to one-shot the seal. The same happened the second time we challenged Price, just because I was a bit too lazy to grind some more, or catch new Pokemon. So, after a tiny bit of more grinding, we challenged Price again. The first seal was taken care of easily by Pikafool, and this time, Drafool was still unable to overcome his biggest foe, and went down to the swine up yet again. Pikafool had to come in and slap the swine up to death. However, because we took the time to level, Pikafool survived the seal's headbutt and electrocuted the seal for our second badge. We caught a Pidgeotto north of Mahogany and named it Pitchfool. A very welcome feature in Crystal Clear is our ability to re-challenge gyms by simply activating the rematches from the gym statues. For grinding, I decided to run Claire's gym again for a number of times. Well, a lot more times. Going by root order, our next gym to challenge was Morty's, where his team was still all Ghastly's. This battle was quite straightforward, as Drafool took down two of Morty's Ghastlies, and Pikafool took care of the rest. Upon exiting the gym with our third badge, the Pokemon League staff of course gave us another call. Creepy. We went back to Price's gym after this, challenging its trainers a lot more times for more levels. During the grind, Drafool finally was able to evolve, attaining his second form, a Dragonair. We finally decided to head to Route 38 next, making our way through the slew of trainers, and ultimately making it to Olivine City. There aren't any sick amphis this time around, 
so coming into Olivine with no added mental pressure is always a welcome change. We visited this fairy building and went to Sandwood City. We found yet another home that listed Randy as his realtor, but we still don't have enough money yet. The seventh hour was opened by us challenging Chuck for the next badge, where Pitchful and Pikafool blitzed their way to victory. Pitchful took care of Chuck's Mankey, and Pikafool zapped Chuck's Poliwhirl into a crisp. The Pokemon League informed us yet again of another badge gain, which you can turn off by the way, but it would be a bit lonely without the Pokemon League staff almost always calling us. With the Fly HM now in our possession, we were now free to fly to any of the cities in Kanto and Johto. That's right, any of them. But I decided to make the journey to Goldenrod on foot, exploring the routes and battling trainers along the way. Before we knew it, we had arrived in Goldenrod City at the 8th hour. We made our way to Bill's house and grabbed a free Eevee, naming it Lil Fool. We then visited the Goldenrod department store, buying a water stone for Lil Fool. Before long, Lil Fool evolved into a Vaporeon. After grinding Lil Fool for a minute, I realized I needed to get the Surf HM for Lil Fool to actually be useful. So, we headed into the Ecrotake Dance Theater, where the Kimono Girls were waiting for a decent challenge. The Kimono Girls' Pokemon also scaled with the number of badges we got, so the evolutions in the Dance Theater were a bit higher leveled. Pikafool almost died here, though we did manage to beat all the Kimono Girls in the end. I forgot which NPC actually gave us the HM, and of course, it had to be the last one we talked to. Before challenging the next gym, we revisited some of the old ones to level up some more. With Lil Fool properly trained and leveled, we went to challenge Jasmine for the 5th gym badge, where it didn't take much to win the battle. With 3 serves, Lil Fool dominated the Olivine gym with style. At the 12th hour, Pitchful evolved into a Pidgeot while grinding over at Siamwood's gym. One thing I forgot to mention is that, while you can challenge all the gyms again after beating them, you could also change the level to challenge them at. If you've gained 5 badges, then you could battle a gym as if it's your 5th gym battle. It's quite a neat feature for leveling up. In between grinding sessions, I decided to make use of the fly feature in the game and flew to Cinnabar Island, catching a Growlithe in the process. It was named Arkfu. We flew back to Goldenrod after an hour of grinding and challenged Whitney to a Pokemon battle. I might have overleveled for a bit at this point, with my team averaging at around level 40. Pikafu decided it would be a good day to spam Thunderbolts, with a complete disregard of Whitney's team's safety. Whitney threw her tantrum as usual, before finally giving us the plane badge. The Pokemon League staff gave us another call as expected. It sure felt like it's been a while since we got a call from them. We took Arkful, our newly minted team member to Azealia Town, where we were able to level him against Bugsy's gym trainers. Arkful doesn't actually learn any useful fire type moves aside from Flame Wheel until level 50, so we have to rely on both Arkful and Pitchful in the fight against Bugsy. Although Arkful was able to take out Bugsy's first two Pokemon, Pitchful had to take over at the end to finish the battle. The Pokemon League staff said something about Professor Elm being generous, so we followed their advice and went to Newbark Town. We visited the professor and got the egg, which a short while later hatched into a Togepi. As you would expect, it was named Togafu. We challenged Faulkner literally two minutes later, and this guy never really stood a chance. Neither did he in all the second generation games. Pikafool had a field day here, spamming yet more Thunderbolts. We defeated Faulkner and got the 8th badge, as well as qualifying to challenge the Elite Four. I definitely didn't feel ready for the Pokemon League, so we headed to Pewter City to challenge Brock, as well as raising the level cap by one more stage. This fight was mostly straightforward, but Little Fool did go down while facing the Onyx, creating a slightly awkward situation. Drafool also failed to take out the Rock Snake Pokemon, leaving it to Arkfool, who ultimately downed the Onyx with bites. When it was time for the Rhyhorn, Arkfool used flamethrowers to take it out. While preparing for the Elite Four, we headed to Goldenrod's department store and bought a Firestone. We slapped the stone on Arkful and witnessed his evolution into an Arcanine. After grabbing the old amber from Peter Museum, we headed to New Cinnabar to talk to Ivan. We gave the fossil to the scientist, hoping he could revive the fossil for us. He told us to wait a bit more, so we did just that and went back to grinding. Drafool finally reached level 55, evolving into the mighty Dragonite. Leveling up does take a while in the older games, so the speed up function is very appreciated. Ivan finally dropped us a call informing us that he had successfully revived the old amber fossil into an aerodactyl. We rushed over to the lab and picked up our newest team member, naming it Aerofool. Leveling Aerofool was no easy feat, as he started from level 5. We challenged Bugsy's gym over and over again, while raising the gym's level when appropriate, before finally feeling ready enough to challenge the lead 4. We went through the usual route to reach the Indigo Plateau checkpoint, and went through the Victory Road. There were almost no trainers in this final stretch, a quite welcome change. After all the grinding we did, this seemed pretty refreshing. We went up to the league receptionist and issued a challenge for the lead 4, before being completely ambushed by this person, who turned out to be Lavender Town's radio DJ. He would then challenge us to a battle, 
completely surprising us with a level curve. I had leveled up my team up to early to mid 50s, thinking it would be enough for the league. But this DJ would then lead with the Steelix, leveled at 56. Arc Fool failed to one-shot the Steelix with a flamethrower and die to an earthquake, so Lil Fool had to come out and finish the job. The DJ sent out an Alakazam next, which kept spamming double kicks for some reason. After a surf and a quick attack, the Alakazam was taken care of. He then sent out his level 63 Scizor, making the level gap even more apparent. Lil Fool couldn't take out the Scizor, leaving it to Drafool to finish. Drafool fell to the Umbreon, and Aerofool was next. Aerofool was able to down the Umbreon and the Tentacruel, which had the chance to poison Aerofool. Aerofool was able to persevere until the end, managing to take out the level 65 Flareon as well. At this point, the game leaves us no choice but to continue forward, where we were introduced to the cast of the Elite Four. The Elite Four featured battles in set mode, with no items usage, making it a bit harder. After watching the cutscene, we challenged Robert for the first Elite Four fight, but were ultimately defeated by his last Pokemon, his Raichu. We spent the next 3 hours just grinding for the Elite Four again, and decided to challenge Misty to help with Pikafu's leveling. Beating Misty was quite easy, as most of our team outleveled hers. We would then challenge Misty's gym a couple of more times after this. We watched the Elite Four cutscene again, and we challenged Robert once more. This time, appropriately leveled, Pitchfool was able to take out the Tangela with wing attacks, as well as his Wigglytuff. Pitchfool fell to the Starmie's Thunder, but Pikafool was able to avenge Pitchfool. For Robert's Nidoqueen, I made a quick switch to Lilfool, where he tanked an Earthquake on the switch in. One surf later, the Nidoqueen went down. Robert's Raichu failed to kill Lilfool with a Thunder, and tank a Chunky Surf. I decided to let Lilfool go down, and took care of the Raichu with Arcfool's extreme speed. The next Elite Four, the Old Man Doom, let with his Noctowl, and I let with Pitchfool again. Pitchfool spam wing attacks again, ultimately downing the Noctowl and the following Octillery, despite almost dying. Doom sent out his shiny Ammonite next, and I sacked Pitchfool here. Pikafool then came out and scored an easy win with Thunderbolt. Pikafool would then continue spamming Thunderbolts, ending the second Elite Four. Fib... Fib... Fibif... Fibif, the following Elite Four, would lead with Anderson, his Alakazam. Arcful was up first, and he would end the Psychic type with extreme speeds after tanking a Psychic. I switched to Lil Fool for the Magmar, drowning it with two Surfs. Lil Fool would then continue to force a number of more Surfs, taking us to Fibif's last Pokemon, a Houndoom. Lil Fool's last Surf wasn't enough to take down the Firehound, finally going down to a crunch. Drafool came out next, ending the fight with a Wing Attack. The last Elite Four was Honeybun, leading with this Gengar. I led Pikafool, who was outsped by the Gengar for the first attack. Pikafool managed to survive, and the returning fire one shot at the Gengar. I switched to Lil Fool for the Steelix, tanking an earthquake on the switch. Lil Fool's Surf took down the Steelix after. Honeybun would send out his own Dragonite, but Lil Fool was well equipped, downing the dragon with three Aurora Beams. I decided to sack Lil Fool for the Slowbro, leaving it to Pikafool to take care of the rest with a Thunderbolt. Honeybun would then send out this Heracross with a question mark, which I don't really get what that's all about, but Pitchful took care of it with one wing attack. For Honeybun's last Pokemon, he sent out a Snorlax. Well, this took a while because of how bulky Snorlax is, but ultimately, Drafool was able to down the Snorlax. For the last fight, we faced the champion, who turned out to be Shock Slayer himself. He led with a shiny Cloyster, and I led with Lil Fool. I immediately switched to Pikafool on a spike setup, and one-shotted the Cloyster with a Thunderbolt. The next Pokemon was a Jolteon, which Arcfool ended up defeating with a Flamethrower. Shock Slayer then sent out a Tyranitar called Tiny, so I sacked Arcfool to get a fresh turn. Lil Fool went back out, taking care of Tiny with two Surfs. Lil Fool went down to the following Blissey, but Aerofool was able to avenge Lil Fool after a number of attacks. Aerofool would then die into the Scizor because of me spamming A and not paying attention, so I sent out Pitchful next. Pitchful would also go down to the Scizor, unable to take it out. My last Pokemon, Drifool, finally took out the Scizor. Shock Slayer then sent out his last Pokemon, another Shiny. This time it was a Skarmory. I thought I was going to lose here, but apparently three waterfalls took down the Skarmory. We won the battle, making us the new champion. We were about to be crowned the new champion, but this swine up came out of nowhere and attacked us. I was expecting this to be some kind of epic battle, so I revived all my team members, but it turned out we just had to beat this tiny swine up. Easy enough. Shock Slayer took us to the Hall of Fame, where we would be inducted as the new champion. But our journey wasn't over. The following battles are the rest of the gym battles, which weren't particularly interesting. So I'll just summarize the following events, which were mixed with grinding here and there. We went to New Cinnabar to beat Blaine with Lil Fool, who as always proved to be a pushover. Even with his Moltres, he didn't stand a chance. Janine also wasn't much trouble, as her Pokemon didn't have any memorable moves and strategy. 
While wandering about the safari zone, I thought it'd be nice to catch the Cyndaquil since I quite like its line. It was named Quilfu. Over at Celadon, Erika was being, well, Erika. Arkful had fun burning all her Pokemon, including her Celebi here. Sabrina proved to be a bit tougher, also because the level cap was scaling with the number of badges I obtained. But our team was never in danger of getting wiped out. Her last Pokemon was a level 70 Dragonite, which was beaten by our own Drafool. I thought this was a nice moment in the battle. By this point, our team was averaging at around level 81. It was only at this time that I remembered that you can have your Pokemon follow you, a game mechanic that I wanted to showcase much, much earlier in the video. My bad. We continued exploring and gym hunting from here on. When we challenged Lieutenant Surge's gym, the soundtrack has got to be my favorite moment in the game. Amazing. I feel bad cutting the audio here, but Aerofool didn't even break a sweat defeating this Raikou. We then went to Viridian City to challenge the final gym leader, Blue. Blue's team was pretty much the same as his default team, but higher leveled. Getting through them was quite predictable, but Blue did send out his legendary, a Mewtwo. It felt fitting that I saved Blue for last, showcasing Kanto's fabled legendary. Drafool hit a critical hit outrage though, so the victory felt kind of cheap. But with that, we got all the badges, both in Kanto and Johto. As all Generation 2 games go, we had to battle the boss trainer at the top of Mount Silver. Or in this case, behind a waterfall in Mount Silver. The trainer you face here vary depending on where you start, and what trainer you choose at the beginning. In my case, I got to face Gold. Gold led with a pseudo Wudu, so I had to switch Pika Fool out for a little fool. The rock slide on the switch didn't do much, and Lil Fool one shot at the rock tree with a surf. Gold's red Gyarados was next, and Pika Fool was able to defeat it with ease. Aerofool was up for Gold's Meganium and took care of the big green thing with two wing attacks. Pikafool came back out for the Feraligator, and another well-placed Thunderbolt was all it took. The Typhlosion that came after put up more of a fight, but ultimately went down to Little Fool's serves. Gold's last Pokemon was his Umbreon, but Aerofool and Drafool both combined their efforts to take it down. Gold disappeared, followed by a message whispering us to come to the forge. The forge was located here behind this rubble, but I could not find the pickaxe for the life of me. I didn't want to look up a guide, so I just wandered about Kanto and Johto trying to look for a cave with this pickaxe. I gave up in the end and looked it up, and it turned out the pickaxe was in the same cave as the rubble. Isn't that nice? Apparently Shock Slayer had gotten trapped inside this place, and we had saved him from eventual death. He said he would give us something, so we had to wait and waste some time. There's an array of things that you could do in Crystal Clear, like battling in the underground arena where I got my ass kicked here by the Mimic Girl, visiting the Ace Trainer HQ, catching all 251 Pokemon, you name it. I wandered about the two regions, quite amazed at the things I found along the way. Finally, it was time to collect a gift from Shock Slayer. The ultimate item. Shock Slayer placed it on the anvil, and it seems like it's a... sword? A sword. That's the final gift. Apparently, the sword is supposed to replace the HM cut, being able to cut thin trees and patches of grass. So, for the remaining time, we were able to fulfill our second dream, cutting and cleaning people's lawns for free, and posting them to YouTube. <laughs>